North Korea has given us an update on Private Travis King, the U.S. Army soldier held in North Korean custody. But there's a little more to the story. North Korea is actually following one of the oldest traditions in the communist bloc playbook. Let's break it down, and I'll show you just what I mean. So, first off... North Korea does indeed confirm that it has detained Travis King. This is interesting because while we know he went over, North Korea was completely silent on whether or not this soldier had been detained. And it makes sense, right? North Korea internally is not going to just take this soldier at his word. If he says that, hey, I am a defector, I was a private um and they may think, oh, he may be a double agent. He may be a much more senior soldier than he's letting on. Um, he may even be a civilian impersonator. Uh, he may be someone trying to gather intelligence. The North Koreans don't know, right, that this public reporting is going to be broadly true and that unlike the North Koreans who control almost all media internal to their country, uh, most independent reporting in the West is, well, independent, right? So they, it's unlikely that these stories about him being a private, getting in a lot of trouble, and sort of impulsively running away uh, aren't, you know, uh, aren't controlled by some shadowy entity at the Pentagon trying to place a, a, a double agent in North Korea. So North Korea is going to take some time to vet that sort of thing. Probably, I suspect, with the help of China, they may also reach out to China and say, hey, listen, big brother, uh, we have this U.S. Army soldier, but we want to make sure that when we deal with the United States and the West on this, that we do so in a way that isn't going to grow against your interests, since North Korea definitely views China as kind of its big brother to the north. So after about a month in detention, North Korea has confirmed that they do have this soldier. Uh, one expert said the announcement was 100% North Korean propaganda. I think that's likely true. Uh, but the interesting part is that the North Koreans claim through the official state news agency, King told them he decided to enter North Korea, quote, because he harbored ill feelings against inhuman treatment and racial discrimination within the U.S. Army. He also, the report also said that King expressed his willingness to seek refuge in North Korea or a third country, saying he was, quote, disillusioned at the unequal American society. And the, uh, the content of, of course, North Korean state news agencies are always carefully calibrated to reflect North Korea's official line that the U.S. is an evil adversary. And this is obviously straightforward, but what's interesting is there's a couple of details. First, the report said that North Korea's investigation into King's illegal entry would continue, right? So it acknowledged that King didn't have a legal reason to be in the country, uh, then the other thing that was interesting is that they left the door wide open to send King to a third country, which is ironic because, of course, at the time that he fled, uh, he was actually being sent to, well, another country, right? He was going to be sent from South Korea back to the United States uh, because he had gotten in uh, so much legal trouble. Uh, he was convicted in a, in, uh, by the Korean judicial system for uh, uh, assault uh, during what seems like a drunken night out. He assaulted a Korean civilian. Um, and then he also attacked Korean police and did significant damage to their police vehicle. Now, <clears throat> Again, what's interesting is that while I can't speak for Private King's entire military service, um, and I certainly would never stake out the claim that there isn't racism in the U.S. Army, I think uh, it's almost certainly true that um, – you know, the U.S. Army, like the rest of the country, is still subject to uh, some level of racial discrimination. Um, but it, the idea that he, this was a deliberately thought out sort of protest move uh, against the U.S. Army is sort of preposterous, right? You generally don't do these sort of um, defections uh, if you really think you're some sort of political dissident. Um, you're not going to do it 
immediately as you're about to face consequences for a string of misconduct, right? No amount of racial discrimination uh, made him fight the Korean cops. Uh, no amount of racial discrimination uh, made him spend time in Korean prison. Um, and no amount of racial discrimination uh, is going to cause his command to uh, send him back to the United States after he is no longer welcome in Korea. Uh, this is, this is again, barring some sort of other dramatic information coming out, uh, there's no evidence that what he was facing was anything other than the consequences of his own actions. Uh, again, if there's new information uh, that'll change my opinion. I'm, I'm, I'm open to it. Uh, but right now it definitely seems, uh, like this is a story of an impulsive young person who got in a lot of trouble and defected. But then you got to ask yourself, why would North Korea suddenly, uh, throw the race card? And, and the answer is actually pretty, uh, you got to go back into history. Um, if you look back, you can see that even as far as the 1920s, um, the Soviet bloc, right, communist countries of which North Korea uh, considers itself to be one, um, have been using uh, American uh, racial issues, racial fault lines, um, taking advantage of those conflicts within the country in an effort to destabilize and achieve their own objectives. Right. As early as the 1920s, the Soviet Union and uh, the Third International, the communist sort of umbrella organization, uh, advocated the creation of what they called the, quote, Negro Soviet Republic. Please don't demonetize me, YouTube. That's the actual name. It's not done in an insulting way. Um, this was an attempt uh, to found or to encourage um a uh, separatism within the United States, mainly to create a sort of um, African American or Black nation uh, within the Southern United States, and the idea, of course, would be that by fracturing the U.S. apart, similar to uh, Russian backing of of modern efforts to break apart the EU, um, that this would weaken their enemy, the United States. And again, if they if they could in fact turn it into a communist republic, it would put a Soviet ally literally on the geographic borders of the United States. Now, since the 1920s, right, the, the uh, Soviet bloc, right, communist countries, uh, evolved their ability to produce and exploit um racial conflicts. In fact, in the 1960s, right, Soviet propaganda uh, began to, bro or not began, but continued to broadcast uh, not just internally, but to other countries in Africa and Latin America, um, covering in some cases uh, accurately, but with heavy spin, and in some cases kind of fictitiously, um, the status of racial discrimination in the United States, particularly during the civil rights era. Um, during the civil rights era, again, they framed many of the uh, conflicts where the federal government um, did not intervene or legally could not intervene. Um, the Soviets would frame this as tacitly supporting the racists uh by because of its unwillingness to antagonize Southern Democrats, uh, unwillingness to basically, basically the inability to get past these Southern Democrats that sat in the House and Senate. Um, the, the Soviets would also point out the hypocrisy of U.S. claims to leadership of the free world, that its racism is indicative of its policies towards other people of color throughout the world. Uh, they also argued that racism is inherent, the Soviets did, that racism is inherent to the capitalist system and that racism um, is a requisite for capitalism because uh, of capitalism's need for low, a low-skilled working class. Um, now, again, 
Uh, some of this was done because there were also considerable um, public embarrassments for the Soviet Union, who was not any better. Worth absolutely pointing out that uh, African and Asian students in the Soviet Union are, were notoriously discriminated against and mistreated. Um, Soviet racial, ethnic, and linguistic minorities um, were what probably meets the definition of deliberately genocided. Um, for example, they would be rounded up and deported from their home, their home regions, oftentimes with many of their cultural symbols uh, destroyed in the process. Those areas would be resettled by European Russians. Um, and I point these things out because the Soviets, right, uh, in and of themselves, claim the U.S. are hypocrites, but in fact, kind of they're all hypocrites. And the uh, Soviet Union running a trail of tears, it seems like every five years, uh, is a little bit hard to take their claims that the U.S. civil rights movement um, took as long as it did to get uh, get going and that the federal government's reluctance and many of the cultural institutions failures that somehow the Soviet system was superior is, is, is pretty comical, but it doesn't matter, right? The truth is the first casualty of war. And it points out this, uh, this is a document actually from, uh, the department of state that points out that, um, between just a two-week period in May of 63, the Soviets broadcast over 1,500 different commentaries, uh, likely primarily radio, um, over uh, into the um, African and Latin American countries, uh, emphasizing, again, the uh, racial uh, issues that the U.S. was grappling with. Um, and so I point all these things out that this is part of a long tradition of uh, kind of nonsense by these Soviet aligned bloc countries. This is a, uh, you know, almost hundred year old, uh, playbook. And again, this isn't, I want to make sure what you know, what this isn't, this isn't me saying like racism's fake. It's not right. You, you know, you gotta be pretty stupid to think that's not true. Um, but the point is, is that when you're a country like North Korea, um, that has no immigration of any kind, uh, that has uh, a level of state control and um, cruelty uh, against its own people at the scale that they do, right? We're talking about multi-generational um, labor camps, uh, unbelievably inhumane death sentences, uh, being eaten by animals or blown up by uh, mortars. You're talking about just a almost comical level of hypocrisy. And again, when they take this complaint and they sort of superimpose it over what frankly was just a young soldier who made a bunch of dumb decisions and was ready to face the consequences and tried to skirt those consequences one more time, well... You know, you're, you, you, they should not be the ones we should listen to. I guess that's not really that stunning a revelation. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for joining me. Um, let me know in the comments below if you think I missed something. And uh, until next time, I'll see you guys in the next one. Cheers.